Madam President, Commissioners, uh, good morning. It's now 1130. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our pre-commission meeting. We'll go ahead and start with any general housekeeping items, comments, questions before we move on to the agenda. Okay. All right. There she is. There she is. <laughs> All right. We'll go ahead then. Questions or comments about the agenda? Commissioner McKinney? Uh, yes, Madam President. I do have a couple of questions for on the uh, consent agenda. All right. Go um, ahead. They're fairly simple questions, but item number three, the liquid asphalt material bid award. Um, <clears throat> in looking at the... Um, the bid award amount compared to the estimate that's up by like 19% and I presume that the estimate was done before a lot of the inflation hit that's I'm, I'm assuming that that reflects inflation I'm wondering though the the staff report did not compare this 7 million ish number with the number from last fiscal year okay. uh, Madam President uh, uh, Commissioner McKinney great questions as always uh, for a little bit of background, you're absolutely right. Uh, when this estimate went in, that was prior to the inflation rates going forward. As you know, gas has gone up about 40% uh, since uh, in the last time frame. For your review, last year we used about one, point, uh, one to two million dollars because we only had one Chips Hill team. This is going to support two Chips Hill teams going forward. Now, I want to remind you that the number that you see there, the total, is a cap. We really don't expect to go over that or approach that, but just that's the cost of doing business today for that amount of oil if we get to that point. Uh, so again, we're, we're planning for two chip still teams, not one. Uh, uh, we do, we did, this does take into account the 40% increase of gas uh, and, and petroleum operations going forward. We are uh, confident that we will not hit that. Uh, number uh, going into next year. Uh, okay. Does, does that answer that? Well, so so the the liquid asphalt amount then from the previous year is probably less than half that I would imagine. If we're only what we used, yes. Again, these are these are to go no further than right. that amount. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, then item number seven, the supplemental agreement for the floating feather road bridge uh, project. Now I assume we're just talking here. We're we're still in the design phase on this am I correct correct and so we're and I I understand this uh, this uh, additional supplemental agreement relates to really a change in scope so yes. an additional item that's being added so I, I completely understand that but I'm looking at the total the total amount of, of uh, the original contract amount was two hundred sixty six thousand dollars we're now over four hundred thousand do all the previous do the previous increases relate to changes in scope or are they other aspects I mean I ask this question because I've been on the other side of this I've been a consultant and I know how uh, things go and sometimes there's a uh, well there are lots of possible reasons for changes in uh, consulting agreement amounts and I'm wondering if I can just get a little more information uh, on this uh, again uh, madam president uh, Commissioner McKinney, another good question good question but yes you're right as scope changes and prices go up and materials go up and labor goes up and then as we uh, about a year year and a half ago uh, we adopted a different policy when we look at these types of things in the past we used to just dig ponds and uh, they uh, the Commission was very adamant about uh, and justifiably so of, of improving that quality of those of those uh, of those ponds so now we do uh, we do vegetation landscaping we do irrigation we do drainage basins versus just ponds. And along that line, it is in, uh, which it comes with that, is increased uh, uh, right-of-way issues, staking uh, issues, those sort of things. So you're right, it is a uh, increase in scope, but this one specifically uh, relates to uh, our environmental teams and the rules of engagement that we're working under now of not just putting a pond out there, but making it more of a uh, um, more pleasing, more aesthetic uh, operation for the community. Uh, uh, does that answer that question? Well, no, and, and I, I absolutely understand um, that, that doing a pond is something, you know, we're doing something different than we were doing before, but we're only in, you know, labor and materials and so on. I don't think we're just in the design phase, correct? Right. So these amounts that we're looking at in the supplemental agreements 
to date on this project don't have anything to do with labor and materials they have to do with just the cost of designing things so my question was first of all are these additional the the previous supplemental agreements including this one do they relate to changes in scope or are they are they primarily focused on changes in scope in the project or do they have to do with other reasons for I'm gonna bring up the he's already expert on this and he can go into those for you all right thank you welcome mr. Lucas thank you no good point good point sir madam president members of the Commission thank you a Commissioner McKinney these are really good questions and thanks for raising this the backstory on this project is it started out just as a bridge project so we were just designing a bridge over a facility up there on floating feather there was a change of scope additional to the one that we have we're speaking about today that was relatively substantial where we added in some sidewalk gaps so connecting in some sidewalk and some pathway that connected to some improvements that were done by a subdivision and so that was covered previously under the previous modifications to this this effort which I think primarily accounts for the cost that you're that you're considering so this is not the first scope change this is really the second kind of major scope change and and that addition of the pathway once again that was at the direction of the Commission to look at areas where we can get in there once and try and make those connections and fill all the gaps we possibly can and with the sidewalk versus pathways and all those things that have come up previously so that that's the I hope that answers your question sir yeah yeah I think it does thank you very much all right thank you any other questions or comments about the agenda no I look like we're good to go director long thank you Stacy if you bring up that first picture please we're gonna do something a little different today commissioners on this but as this is working there it is first off I'd like to let you know today is also a very special day here at the Ada County Highway District we will be celebrating two birthdays during your break the first one belongs to a tremendous new member of our team that we're very happy that have elected join us Rachel where are you there she's there she's celebrating a birthday today and so she's on one scope of the spectrum happy birthday then we have the other scope of the spectrum so the general counsel later this week will be celebrating his birthday and he's not going to be here during that daytime so we thought we'd do it all at once so on behalf of the entire team happy birthday thank you for the great job that you do every day commissioners as you all know we held a very successful annual charity golf event that benefited kids and it benefited kids in just an absolutely huge way as you know we we supported this year the first tee of Idaho which is not just about golf it's about ethics it's about character it's about helping kids some in difficult situations moving forward so we were very blessed by the generosity of the public once again and as you can see they were very very generous so we set a new record of two hundred and thirty thousand dollars that will make a tremendous impact into a lot of kids lives going forward and again again events like this just don't happen it takes an amazing team to put this together we had so many members of the county highway district volunteering volunteering their their time to make this work and so it's however we had a few that I'd like to present some special recognition for and like you to come off the dais and congratulate them as we do this if you would please first off Joe can you come forward for this this is and at the end of the day we had to give him a day off just to recover I don't think Regina Regina 
Cunningham, he's not still work in the golf tournaments and, and all the Christy, come on up. Christy is the artist and the brains and all the different things he put up on all those banners that go up on that golf course. So again, uh, thank you for all that you've done. We have the executive team who really put in the hours. this golf tournament probably would not have happened again to the success that it did. So with that, Dean, for the tremendous job we <laughs> And there's a reason why we're uh, very nicely done. so much time just to get everything started and now she's putting in so much of her own to her car with some of the weirdest things I've seen uh, going forward but uh, let me tell you that there is a heart behind this race so and then we have the Many talents. One of them, he should enter the uh, the U.S. National Arm Wrestling Championship of the world because he would win based on all of the arms he twisted uh, to ensure that we had another successful uh, event. Now, Commissioner May, thank you. You were there and you saw what we presented him. I can't present part of that in today's environment uh, here at the district uh, and such. However, go ahead and smell the slide. No, I. I, 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 I Commissioners, as you saw with my update yesterday, uh, we were honored again uh, with another award here at Data County Highway District. Uh, a very prestigious uh, Founders Association award was garnered to the uh, 
to ACHDs and can I have Edinson uh, stand up please? There you are. Uh, Edinson uh, uh, was the one out of many that was selected uh, based on his work for the uh, bicycle map projects here uh, and these will be awarded in October. October so uh, again Edison on behalf of the entire team congratulations thank you. Good job. And then uh, for the final part of my director's report uh, I would like to share two TikTok videos with you. Uh, these are the newest that have come out of our communications team uh, and uh, uh, the message is get there safely and I will let the uh, Deputy Director of Communications know that her challenge to me uh, when she said if I don't get this they'll be perfect. I did get them on the first uh, go and they are perfect uh, and such across the board. So if we could show those to the Commission please. A little game and see how good you are at noticing details. When these people go through the crosswalk, count how many times something gets tossed in the air. Ready? Go. Madam President, we can't hear it. We can't hear it. Oh. And did you guess right? Maybe you did, but did you notice what changed? Try it again. Yeah. yeah. They weren't hearing it on there. Okay. Thanks for letting us know. Give a thumbs up, Alexis, if you're hearing it when you start. Hey guys, play this little game and see how good you are at noticing details. When these people go through the crosswalk, count how many times something gets tossed in the air. Ready? Go. Did you guess right? Maybe you did, but did you notice what changed? Catch any of that? If you're not paying close attention when you drive, you're missing a lot more than you realize. Don't drive distracted. Let's get there safely. Okay, so how many fries do you think my homie can eat with ketchup? Pay super close attention and remember, only, only count the ones with ketchup. All right, ready? And go. <laughs> Come on, come on. You got it, bro. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Stop. See that? Did you guess the right answer? Let's check that replay. Were you so focused on the fries that you totally missed the gram gram at the bus stop? Dance until the doll comes falling down. If you're eating or on your phone when you drive, you're missing more than you think. Promo is popping off. Don't be distracted. Let's get there safely. Where are you? So, Commissioner, it's the first of many on this very important uh, initiative of making sure that uh, uh, drivers are paying attention across the board. So, great job. Uh, really appreciated those and stuff. So, Commissioners, that's my director's report for the day. Uh, you have a little bit of time. I would. Uh, invite you all to join Steve and Rachel for some birthday cheesecake uh, in the back, unless you have any questions for me. All right, any questions, comments? No, nope. Madam I'm President. Oh, Commissioner Pickering. Sorry, really quick question. And I, uh, Director Wong, forgive me, I, I think I get this question a lot, and I don't really know how to answer it either, but um, I've noticed that they're in a new development off of 
Emerald and Maple Grove on that corner. There is some encroaching encroachment of like the uh, fencing material. There's a huge apartment complex going in there. And there's a ton of goat heads on their side of the property and on the sidewalks. And so I just kind of want to know who do I need to reach out to to either get the contractor and the developer to do their side of the sidewalk. And then I'll see if I can, you know, wrangle some folks to help get this, the goat heads on the sidewalk on our side of things, but it is like atrocious. It's, it's super bad. Okay. Uh, commissioner, I think you just have. Oh, yeah. I, I missed that. Sorry. You it's just, on the list. You, you just have. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. About 10 minutes. Yeah. So commissioners, please join us in the back.
Uh, Madam President, Commissioners, good afternoon. It's uh, 12 o'clock. All right. Welcome, everyone. Please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for All right, thank you very much. First item on our agenda is to adopt it. So okay. moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, next item, consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless a commissioner or a citizen so requests, in which case the item will be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda. All consent agenda items are commission action items unless noted. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move that we approve the consent agenda. I'll second that. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes. All right, back to the regular agenda. There are no items on our regular agenda. So that will take us down to public communications. Is there anyone here that would like to address the commission or on Zoom, Stacy? Is there anybody on Zoom that would like to address the commission? would be no. All right, seeing none, then uh, we will stand adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Now we will go into our work session. We have three items on that today, and we will be starting with the Rose Hill Street Temporary Traffic Calming, Roosevelt Street Vista Avenue concept pre-adoption presentation by staff. And if I'm correct, we are not, this is not an action item today. You will be coming back at the end of the month, correct? Madam President, that's correct. All right, welcome, Ms. Inselman. Thank you. Sorry, just getting a little adjusted here. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Commission. Um, for the record, Christy Inselman, uh, Planning and Programming Supervisor. I'm here to present to you on the concept study for uh, Rose, Hill, Rose Hill Temporary Traffic Calming. Okay. Yeah, it worked. So, just a, a little history on the project, kind of going back and starting from the beginning. So this project came about um, as a commission directive last year. When we came to you for the Rose Hill and Owyhee intersection, we received that direction from you guys to come back this year with another concept study to look at the entire corridor. Because we did hear from residents during that outreach that there were larger issues with the corridor besides just the intersection. Intersection, very important. Thank you, you guys adopted a preferred treatment there. Um, but you also wanted us to come back and look at some temporary treatment options for the corridor. So that's what we did. The uh, consultant firm that we hired was Kittleson and Associates. So the project extents for this is from, is on Rose Hill, from Roosevelt Street to Vista Avenue. It's right at one mile um, in length. This particular roadway is uh, classified as a residential arterial. It's a very unique corridor um, in that it's an arterial, but it has a ton of front on housing on this corridor. It has a lot of attractors in the area. There's a lot of schools that are served by this corridor, as well as um, you get to downtown from this area for a lot of people. There's parks, there's a lot in this area. So the corridor itself is two lanes um, with the center turn lanes on multiple segments. So there are two that you can see there on the map, the ones that, are, that say C. Those are ones that actually have a center turn lane. There's a section B there from Leita to Owyhee. It does not currently have um, a center turn lane today. It's a little slightly narrower section um, of the roadway. So for the public outreach, the first public outreach um, section on this concept study, we went out to the public to find out what their concerns were, what they would like to see for the corridor, um, so we knew what direction to give our consulting firm. So we went out and met with a lot of people, um, wonderful people on that corridor. I feel like I live there now. I've been out there so, <laughs> so often. So we held stakeholder meetings. We started back in February. We held um, six different stakeholder meetings. We met with our um, PAG, ADA, um, and bicycle advisory committees to present on this project and get their feedback. We held an online survey for two weeks in March. Um, we also did a door-to-door -door outreach to the entire corridor. We knocked on every single door, talked to people, gave them flyers to please participate in the survey. Um, and then we also did a leadership walk on the corridor in the rain. It was beautiful. And uh, <laughs> it was great. 
And so we actually got really great response um, for this first public outreach. We had over 200 people respond on this, this first phase to tell us what they wanted to see on the corridor. So for their concerns, we did ask them to rank them. So the biggest concerns we saw right there in that box, which was to improve crossings for those that, that walk and bike that corridor. Mm -hmm. um, they don't feel safe crossing the corridor. Um, the number two that ranked very high along with the crossings was slowing traffic, vehicle traffic on that corridor. Um, the third rank was providing bike lanes because today it doesn't currently have them. It has attached sidewalks, a parking lane, and then the travel lanes. And then the other two down there are um, maintaining the center turn lane and maintaining some on-street parking. Those fell towards the bottom, but they were concerns that were ranked by the residents on the corridor. We also had our consultant do some analysis of the corridor in the early stages. Um, they looked at the crash history for that corridor. As you can see um, on that section on the left, there is a pretty significant accident history along that corridor. Um, you can see that Rose Hill and Owyhee is one of the areas of concern, but with that new treatment on that intersection, could hopefully reduce those. We also saw that there were some issues there specifically where Vista and Rose Hill tie into mm -hmm. each other. That there's a lot of accidents and it seems like a lot of the bike and peds occurred there. Majority of those ha um, happened there. And then the traffic speeds and volumes, we found a residents telling us that people are going too fast. They are. Um, so the 80, 85th percentile, they are on average going about five uh, miles per hour over the posted speed limit, which is 30 miles an hour. And then the last box there on the um, bottom right is the parking utilization. We wanted to see um, were people actually parking the corridor for that parking lane that runs the entire length. And overall, they're not. There were a few pockets of areas. Um, as you can see, the orange there closest to Roosevelt and then closest over on Vista. There were a couple pockets that they were being parked, but the vast majority, it was not a lot of parking that was occurring, and that was witnessed by staff as well. And when they did the parking utilization, they did that over a wide range. They did it during school drop-off times. They did it during weekends. They did it mornings, evenings. So they went out a lot to make sure they got accurate data. So after we heard from the public what their concerns were, we had our consultants draft up, draft up three different alternatives for the corridor. Um, so I'm going to walk through each of those alternatives. Um, because this is a temporary treatment, the um, objective was usually utilize the existing infrastructure of the corridor. So these would be temporary treatment options. We're not looking, at least with this concept, to go in and rip anything out. We want to use what's there. And the width of the corridor currently is between 43 and 47 seat, feet wide. So that's what we worked within. <coughs> so alternative one, oh, and uh, towards the end, we also looked at some additional spot treatments that we asked the public to weigh in on. So I'll go over those after I go through the corridor um, alternatives. So uh, alternative number one is separated bike lanes um, keeping the center turn lane and no parking. So in essence, what you're seeing here is removing all of the parking that was existing on the corridor and replacing it with bike facilities. And those bike facilities are protected. It's a little hard to see in the picture, but we are showing some candlesticks. And um, does this bad guy got a pointer? Is it the side? Maybe. Point to where we're doing that. Um, it's kind of hard to see. Candlesticks is a treatment called an armadillo. So that's something that we potentially would look as well. So those are a little bit lower profile um, than the candlesticks, but they are reflective and they are permanently mounted to the ground so that a car hit, it's going to give it a little nudge. It's not going to be super comfortable for a car to hit those. So that's what we're currently showing. Um, and obviously along the corridor, those treatments wouldn't impede all of the driveways that currently tie into the corridor. So this is the first alternative that we looked at. Alternative number two is um, separated bike lanes. Again, it's very similar to that first treatment with regards to um, providing bike facilities that are protected with those armadillos and a um, candlestick style. Um, but we would be keeping on-street parking on one side of the road and that would alternate. So we wouldn't keep it just on one side, the entire corridor, it actually would change from side to side, which in effect would also create a bit of a chicane effect where you don't have that long straight corridor. It's gonna force the traffic to pay attention a little bit more and move from side to side. Um, and with this though, we're removing that center turn lane. 
So cars that are turning would stop the lane of traffic in order to turn. Alternative number three is um, a chicane treatment um, on some sections of the corridor. Um, keeping on-street parking where it is today, in essence, except for, um, whoops, let me go back. You can kind of see this here of the chicane where we've used paint and some vertical elements to, again, make the cars move um, within the corridor itself. And then the center turn lanes would be turned into a kind of pseudo landscape median. It's, it's meant to replicate that. So we would lose the, the center land, landscape medians on this one as well. So those are the three alternatives that we put out to the public. And so during our second outreach efforts, um, we wanted to hear from them what their preference was. So we had an online survey showing those draft alternatives um, from June 9th through the 23rd. We also held a PIM on the 16th. And when we got the initial resu results from that, we had about 86 people participate, which was great. But we found that very few people that actually live on the corridor participated in the online survey. So we conducted another corridor outreach, a door to door. We went to every neighbor on the corridor. Um, I personally got to talk to about 27 residents um, and that was great. We got a few more people to participate um, and that was held over five days. It took us five days to do it because um, I talk a lot and I wanted to make sure they understood all of our alternatives. I'll be completely honest. So, um, what did we hear from everybody? So we've got two graphs here on the bottom. So the first one, should, oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. Um, so the first one here is what we heard collectively from every single person that took the survey, whether they live on the corridor or not. Um, and as you can see, the first alternative overall was higher, but alternative two was a close second. Um, but if we look specifically at people that live on the corridor, um, that switches. We see that alternative two jumps out and alternative three jumps out. And part of that reason that we heard from the door-to-door -door knock was parking. They wanted to retain some parking. And alternative number one does not provide any parking for the people along the corridor. So between the public's recommendation and the project team, uh, we are recommending alternative number two because that provides some of the facilities that the um, public told us that they wanted, which is the bike facilities, but also retaining some of that parking that's needed. Um, the parking would go where we're seeing the need for the parking. Because of that parking utilization, they have a really great idea where the corridor is currently parked today that we can continue to maintain that for them. So um, the estimated cost to do this, it is a temporary treatment, is about 390,000. And um, this is one we would look to roll in as an in-house design so that we can stay on track with the same time frame as the Rose Hill and Owyhee intersection project that is also currently under design today. And so those are the alternatives. And now I'll talk about the additional treatment options. So we went to the public with four additional treatment options along the corridor in addition to those other alternatives. And the ones we took to them were speed cushions. And so these are kind of a, I like to call it a cousin of a speed bump. Um, they're not quite the same. They're a little, little bit longer and flatter on the top. But th this is an example where there's cutouts on those um, speed cushions and those are specifically designed for emergency services um, so that they are not hindered in any way. And um, as an aside, all of these treatment options and these alternatives, we did meet with the um, uh, Boise Fire um, to talk to them about these treatments and they were actually fine with all of them. So that's why we left them in. So the second treatment option is the traffic circle. Um, these are some just some small, smaller treatments that would go in a couple of the intersections to again, try to divert that traffic so it's not a long straight corridor to try to get the people to slow down a little bit and be a little bit more cognizant of, of what's happening at those intersections, um, specifically with like bikes and pets crossing. The third option was speed feedback signs. And I will tell you, driving down that corridor, again, it's so wide open and it's so straight. Mm -hmm. I caught myself speeding going down that corridor. It is very easy to do. So these are kind of nice because they tell you immediately whether you're meeting the posted speed limit. Um, the last one here on the, cor on the bottom uh, right is bulb out and corner treatments. Um, we specifically were looking at doing this type of a treatment at the Rose Hill and Vista. As you saw from that crash history, there's some issues there because it is a very wide sweeping corner that people don't have to slow down a lot to make that corner. So in essence, this would replicate a new curb line 
So cars making that southbound turn lane or even the left turn lane onto Rose Hill would have to make a more of a 90 degree angle and couldn't make such a wide sweeping turn. This is, again, some of these pictures are not the ex exact of what's gonna go out there because we were not, we would not put some uh, just cones out there in the middle, but we were trying to find some picture representation because we've not really done this before. So this is what we have. Um, and then this, oops, dang it, again. And this one here on the corner, there would be in addition to some hard treatments like the armadillo or even um, these treatments up here, these are uh, fixed to the ground and they're kind of like a, like a stopper bar that we could even um, put down in here. So anybody making that corner, they're gonna feel it if they go over the line. So, and what we heard from the public for support for these um, traffic calming options was we, we got um, over 50%, close to 60 um, on the bulb outs at the intersections, was that three out of the four they were in support of. The one that we didn't get over 50 was the speed cushions. Um, so that's not one we would make a recommendation, recommendation to take forward, but we would take the um, other three as part of our recommendation. So the next steps in the process is to come back to you <laughs> and get your preferred alternative. And we currently have it scheduled for September um, 28th for um, the night meeting for the uh, preferred alternative adoption. And I will stand for any questions. I've just got to say that is the most significant outreach. The way that you, I, mean, I kind of lost count of how many times you've gone back and done yeah. a touchback. And so, you know, you've really got some reliable data as to what the preference is out there. Yeah. So yeah. they got to know me by name. They're so, yeah. Christy, you're here back. Here she comes again. Yeah. So <laughs> you're here again. Yeah, yeah very again. impressive, very impressive. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you for doing that. Uh, commissioners, any questions or comments? Yes, I'll, I'll uh, attempt to channel Commissioner Hansen and thank you for that outreach to the neighbors. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I know the kind of outreach that we do. And so it, at times it makes me a little bit testy when people accuse us of doing very little because that's absolutely not the case. And, and this reminded me to some degree of when we were doing outreach on 5th and 6th a couple of years, couple three years ago to determine what the businesses wanted to see over there. And that that's just great. Thank you. Really exceptional. Yeah, thank you very Madam much. Madam President. Uh, Commissioner Pickering. I just want to say thank you, Christy. And um, I'm piggybacking on what Commissioner Goldthorpe shared. I think, again, the work that you did to do the door knocking you know, that we could have gone into a different direction and just supported option one initially. And again, I think it's so impactful to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I know it takes time and resources, but it helps us make so much better decisions. So I just wanna say thank you for that. And um, yeah, caring so much about the folks on the corridor as well as just doing a really good project. And I want to just highlight that I really appreciate the packet that you presented from Kittleson. Like I loved that you had the crash data there. That really helps us understand the need and the historical background. And of course, that's just the, what actually has happened, not the near misses, right? So we know that there's probably how many more near misses that haven't been counted, right? So just want to say thank you for that and making sure that that was part of this packet as well as that parking utilization that, that was fantastic again helps us make really good decisions and, and reinforcing what folks on the ground are saying is or isn't happening and how we should build that road so um and then of course like the turning radius i'm just like yes because i've seen that myself i just think that's a fantastic idea and we can test and see if that makes any differences with those you know lower impact improvements um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you. And, and is there any talk about doing a leading pedestrian interval if it isn't already on that Vista Rose Hill um, intersection? Um, Madam President, Commissioner Pickering. Yeah, we are um, at a couple of the intersections that are currently signalized. Um, we are looking at that as, as part of this as well. Sorry, I didn't speak to that. And then we are also, I didn't speak to this as well, but we are also, we did this data collection. We're gonna get additional data before we ever put anything in. And then we're gonna go back. And that's one of the things that we talk to the residents about is, that's one of the good things about the temporary treatment option is we can go put something out there, leave in for a while so people get used to it, and then go back and see, is it working? Taking additional analysis after, is it, is it slowing traffic? 
do people feel safer crossing um, the intersection? So we're, we're doing a lot of that as well. And then just as a tag on to the um, outreach, I do gotta give a shout out to our wonderful communication staff <laughs> who went out with me and braved the uh, heat and everything as well as our interns. They, they were wonderful enough to go out there with me and, and talk to the public as well, so. That's fantastic. And I just wanna say yeah. too, I noticed in the, in the packet it said that folks thought that the the median turning lane was helpful. Could you explain a little bit, like was it just helpful to turn or were there other insights about retaining that center turn lane that are helpful? Uh, Madam President, Commissioner Pickering, yes. Um, a few people that we talked to, um, they went back and forth on that. Most of them did like to have that because it's existing. Obviously there's a section that doesn't have it today. So we have to, the traveling just stops. And they felt that, you know, they were a little bit hesitant about removing that because it does help them get in and out. But again, with that mini roundabout going in, that's going to help some turning movements where they don't necessarily feel like they have to turn left. They'll be able to go down there and make that little sweeping turn to go the other direction and not have to make those um, a little riskier, riskier movements. But it's, it's kind of one of those where you kind of got to get used to. Um, and we do expect to see some type of a result of that immediately, but then once people get used to the, uh, the treatment on there. But again, it's, if it's not working, then we can look at doing something else, yeah. Because yeah, I wonder too, if it's, um, if, if it's rooted in the fact that people go fast and you know, yeah. they, need, they feel safer, right? Yeah. Getting out of yep. the travel lane. So again, hopefully with some of these treatments, that speed and fear can be diminished so that it's a lot more comfortable to, to make those turns, but. Okay, thank you, Christy, great work. Thank you. And we'll find out that data, right? When you yep, go back absolutely. out there. So, we yeah, will. yeah, significant value added again. Yeah, very, very good job, Christy. Commissioner McKinney. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, Christy, this is all very good. Thank you for this. Let me ask a, a couple of questions, and I wonder, I don't know if we can bring back the slides. There are, there are a couple I'd like to refer to. Um, <laughs> first of all, is the intention uh, with uh, option two, uh, would that alternative uh, ah, place the parking there we go. Yeah, let's see. My my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there are there are significant portions of this uh, uh, corridor that have driveways, houses that front onto the street with their driveways, and portions that don't. Is that is that accurate? Um, Madam President, Commissioner um, McKinney, that is. Uh, the, there are a lot of driveways um, okay. on there. There are some that don't front directly. If there is a side street, some of the residents actually front onto those side streets, mm -hmm. um, but there's still a significant number. I'd say there's approximately 80 homes that have driveways directly onto right. Rose Hill on this one mile stretch. And we have segments where there's driveways on both sides. So you've got homes fronting Correct. on both sides of the street. Okay. Absolutely. Because I, I have to say, I, I, I have to admit, if, if I were a resident, I would want to be able to have parking in front of my home and so I can I can certainly understand that why the residents wouldn't want all of the parking to be eliminated is the intent um, is the intent to uh, keep center turn lanes where cross streets meet for example you have some of these um, just residential cross streets that connect but we don't have uh, you know, it might be a, a three-way intersection, a T intersection or the like. Is there intention to keep left turn lanes, center left turn lanes there? Um, Madam President, Commissioner McKinney, no, in most cases. So there are multiple intersections that are currently signalized where we have those left turn lanes. So um, Rose Hill and Roosevelt is, inter is signalized, Lata is signalized. We would be doing a new treatment at Rose Hill and Owyhee, which would be the um, mini roundabout where people can make those turning movements and then down at Vista. But the, there are a couple side streets and most of them dead end. Most of them don't go through. Um, those ones, there's not enough room is really the reason why we wouldn't do some type of like a left turn bay or something like that. Cause there's just, we're limited when we're trying to use the existing infrastructure mm -hmm. and trying to put bike lanes and trying to keep some parking. We just can't fit it all in. Right. Well, but we I did, um, if you can kind of see on the map, uh, is that the, the map that we're showing? So 
you can see here, um, and I, these two streets right here where we've denoted, those are ones that we would look to do those um, temporary traffic circles. So those would aid in some of that turning movement. Oh, I see. So a temporary traffic circle, not just at the, uh, we see something at the intersection of, um, I don't know what street that is there uh, in the middle. This yeah. one is Rose Hill and Owyhee. This right. is the um, alternative that you guys um, approved last year. Okay. And then for temporary, we would look at these two locations for some um, traffic circles, temporary traffic circles to help with those turning movements as well. Okay. It, would would it not be if you're going to put in a traffic circle a temporary traffic circle at those locations <laughs> would you not have to eliminate the on-street parking to make room for the traffic circle in any case and um commissioner mckinney that's something we would work out in design but some of those locations yes we would want to eliminate at those intersections potentially anyway for sight distance Okay. for pedestrians crossing and things like that. We don't we don't want cars parking all the way up to the intersection anyway, right. um, and they're not allowed today anyway. There's already signs out there say no parking from here like to the intersection. So it, we would similarly do that, but all of the signage and paint markings and locations would all be worked out in design this next year. Okay. Well, and the reason I ask is because if you have to if you have to take extra space in any case, it would seem that the option of a center left turn lane right in that vicinity is saying. still uh, is still a possibility. Okay, um, what is this new? Uh, we've we've talked about you know traffic calming and so on. Are there any specific provisions though for uh, enhancing uh, specifically the safety of crossings? Because that was one of the bigger big uh, issues that the residents uh, noted. Mm -hmm. um, what is this plan? do specifically for crossing treatments? Um, President May, Commissioner uh, McKinney. So there's a couple things that we're gonna be doing. So this is gonna be done in conjunction with the intersection at Rose Hill um, in Owyhee with a mini roundabout that will also have our RFBs, um, so the rectangular rapid flashing beacons on all four legs. And if you initiate one, it initiates all. So it kind of shuts down that whole roundabout for pedestrians and cyclists to get where they need to go. So we're gonna be making that. Um, improvement for the bikes and peds. Um, as part of their analysis, we're gonna take a look at these two signalized intersections, because I believe um, can, um, Pickering asked about um, LPIs, so mm -hmm. leading pedestrian intervals. We'll be looking at it there. And then we have an existing RRFB here at Peasley, um, and that is, that's one of the corners we would look to do that additional treatment type by moving that curb line out so they're more visible, so they have that crossing. And that's what we heard there specifically, is people were like, people, we're not visible enough, and cars don't see us and slow down for us. So if we can make them more visible, um, and then with that treatment type, similarly at Vista and Rose Hill, by moving that curb line out, again, it's gonna make those bikes and peds more visible and make that um, a shorter, safer crossing for them. So we do have that implemented throughout the project as well as some places where they can hopefully feel safer to cross. And we'll find out after, we'll go back out and talk to them and do you feel safer crossing this right. roadway now with these treatments? And if they don't, then there's something else we need to try. Right, yeah. okay, I agree, I think these are all uh, very good uh, items. I look forward to the final plan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. You. Here, I'll get to the end of mine. Good I job. <laughs> you jumped the gun on me. All right. Next up, Boise Central Bench Neighborhood Transportation Plan. Again, a pre-adoption presentation. Recent award winner. <laughs> Congratulations again. Thank you, Commissioner May. Welcome. Just going to test it this quickly. There we go. Good afternoon, Commission. My name is Cedric Bautista, ACAZ Senior Transportation Planner. In today's work session, we wanted to give you an update on the Boise Central Bench Neighborhood Transportation Plan, including a summary of the public involvement and the proposed project list. This work session is information briefing only, so no decision uh, so no decision is required from the commission at this time. Uh, we're also planning to come back in front of the commission for adoption consideration on September 28, 2022. We look forward to that. Oh, uh, this person, I wanted to begin this presentation with the introduction to what are neighborhood plans and how are we using them uh, as an ACHD planning tool. 
Uh, the concept of neighborhood plan started back in 2012 with the development and adoption of the Boise Central Bench. The primary purpose of these plans is to work with the communities and identify priorities for future transportation plans, projects. To allow us to focus on, on a neighborhood level, we decided to break up the county into more concentrated planning areas based on each of the city's comprehensive plans. Uh, the image on this slide shows the breakdown of these planning areas. In total, we have 15 planning areas without including downtown Boise. With that brief introduction, I'm happy to inform you that this year, we're completing the development of the first iteration of the neighborhood plans with the Barber Valley Neighborhood Plan and starting a new cycle of updates with the Boise Central Bench. In addition to the planning area, in this slide, we wanted to present ACHD level completion for all or countywide neighborhood plans. Of the 1,272 projects identified, 301 projects have been completed, and 322 projects are programmed in the Adopted Integrated Priority Work Plan 2022-2026. Combining both numbers, this represents a level of completion of 49%. This graph reflects that once these neighborhood plans are adopted, there is an ongoing process to evaluate and construct the identified projects. The Boise, Central, the Boise Central Bench planning area and key destinations are highlighted in this slide. The light polygon delineates the planning area. As mentioned before, the Boise Central Bench was first adopted back in 2012. Through this planning process, we conducted a comprehensive review of the planning area and worked with the community to identify potential bicycle and pedestrian projects. At the time, we conducted a robust public outreach with the use of online tools and in-person meetings. From that effort, we received a total of 367 public comments. With the use of the public input and a comprehensive review of the area, a total of 112 pedestrian projects and 57 bicycle projects were identified. The, the two maps showcase the projects identified in the adopted Boise Central Bench. In this slide, we wanted to, to showcase the projects completed in the Boise Central Bench area. In summary, ACHD has completed a total of 56 projects, which represent 36 pedestrian projects, 16 pro bicycle projects, and two crossing projects. This project includes the Casha Street Bikeway, the Shoshone Street Bikeway, Emerald Street Bike and Pedestrian Improvement, Alpine Street Pedestrian Improvement, and Philippi Bicycle and Pedestrian Improvements. In total, this project represents an approximate investment of $25 million to date, not including projects associated with maintenance, safe sidewalk, and ADA improvement projects. In addition to the work done so far, ACHD continues to plan and program projects in the Boise, in the Boise Central Bench area. Some of these projects include the Kidney Street Project, the Roosevelt Street Project, and the Nesper Street, just to mention a few. Now entering into the update of the Boise Central Bench Neighborhood Plan, it marks the it marks the second iteration of uh, the second iteration of neighborhood plans. With this update, one of our main goals is to report back to the community with a progress report showing the level of completion of the projects identified back in 2012. Additionally, since the adoption of the Boise Central Bench plans, guidelines, and best practice have changed within ACHD. Our intent is to implement these new plans, updated guidelines, like the implementation of the Railways to Bikeway Master Plan and the Livable Street Performance Measures into the updated plans. Lastly, as part of the neighborhood plans process, we want to continue to work with the community to identify their transportation needs within each of the planning areas. One of our main goals through this neighborhood plan process is to engage and work with the community to identify what improvements are needed within each of their neighborhoods. To achieve this goal, we met with community groups and key stakeholders to inform them about the project, collect initial input, and respond to questions regarding the plan and updating process. Following this meeting, we coordinated with the school district and schools in the area to know what a, more about how students travel to and from school, their experiences and challenges. 
Additionally, we conducted a virtual public uh, outreach to reach out to the general public to present our findings and collect input regarding their transportation needs. With the information collected, we identified, reviewed, and prioritized additional projects to include in the recommended project list. For the school outreach, ACAC coordinated with the Boise School District to reach out to the schools within the planning area. From this effort, three schools participated in the Boise Central Bench area, with eight class, representing eight classrooms participating, participating between fourth and sixth, sixth grade, which represent a total of 162 students. Some of the comments received include concerns with vehicle speeds, busy streets, and having to cross major roadways. For public outreach, the, a virtual tool was launched from April 5th to May 3rd, and the public was invited to provide comments on their transportation needs in the central bench. A total of 300 comments were received during this period. From this effort, the public provided comments regarding sidewalk gaps, orchard, the Orchard Street corridor, and a bikeway improvements to avoid major roadways. With a comprehensive review of existing conditions, the adopted plans, and the public outreach data collected, a new recommended project list was developed that combines projects from the 2012 adopted project list, the projects program in the Integrated Fire Work Plan 2022-2026, and a new project identified through this updating process. The complete draft recommended project list was included in the staff report. This draft project list consists of 88 projects, where 16 are bicycle projects, 38 pedestrian and ADA projects, 7 crossing projects, 9 intersection improvement projects, 2 shared use pathway projects, 2 road in roadway improvement projects, 3 bridge projects, 8 traffic calming projects, and 3, plan three planning projects. Additionally, staff would like to highlight as shown in this slide and the slide before, that there is a total of 50 projects programmed in the adopted integrated fire work plan 2022-2026. This reaffirms ACC commitment to continue implementing the neighborhood plans and the adopted projects. The remaining 38 projects break down into 18 new projects and 20 previously identified projects. As as next step, staff will release the draft plan on September 14 for public comments until September 28, when we will come in back, back in front of the Commission for Adoption Consideration. Staff would, would like to emphasize that ACAC, that ACAC, with the support of the Commission, continues to work with, on, on these commitments to the public when developing and adopting these neighborhood plans. As the projects are identified, we move them forward through the planning, scoping, design, and finally, the construction of each of the identified improvements. With these new iterations, we will report back the progress done and continue to work with the public to identify any new transportation need in each of the planning areas. And with this, I conclude my presentation and stand for any questions. Nicely done, Edinson. Appreciate all the information. I'm really interested in the outreach that you did with the schools. I think, what did you say, 162? Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more. Not necessarily today, but um, part of the presentation, what they had to say, what their input was. But I think that was really an important uh, part of this important piece to hear what the kids have to say. So nicely done. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, questions, comments? Yeah, I, I appreciate that, sort? too. Just as Commissioner May said, uh, we've done outreach before at schools and had the kids talk to their parents, talk to us. And I know that in my district down around Lake Hazel Elementary and Middle Vaps has made a big difference in the uh, facilities that we've constructed, whether they be temporary or permanent or sidewalk gap fillers. Thank you. Yeah, you have pretty good insight and it's some good, good suggestions and yeah, thoughts. So I, I'm, I'm really impressed that you did that. Commissioner McKay? Yeah, uh, Anderson, just one, one quick question. On the um, online interactive tool that was uh, used for the people to uh, make comments. The, um, it looked like there was a, a map showing, of course, the boundaries of the area and a whole lot of different little icons in there. Does it, is it showing the location of where the commenter lives or is it the location of, of where the commenter is making suggestions? Or does it do both? So May, Commissioner McKinney, it, it, it refers to the location that they're, uh, re they're referencing. So it will be the location they are looking to 
for an improvement or right. any need. Okay, great. Thank you. I, obviously, this, this kind of information is always helpful and look forward to all of your recommendations. When you, when you come Madam President, you. Commissioner Pickering. Edinson, thank you so much for this. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, I noticed, and of course you have it here on the, you know, recommended projects, you know, Orchard Street from Overland to Emerald, deep listed pedestrian ADA improvements. Um, it's a high priority. It's shown, you know, so many of those intersections were highlighted in other parts of the of the report, but you know, Orchard needs more than just, and I understand this is just a, you know, a bike pit plan, but Orchard needs more than just um, sidewalks and um, ADA improvements. So what's your thought process on how we can leverage this plan to have a bigger conversation with the city and um, neighborhoods and all the same partners that were part of this process? Commissioner May, Commissioner Pickering, uh, so great question. Certainly that was uh, through this uh, planning effort, it was a, uh, Orchard Street was a big conversation topic for the public. Or, and our recommendation through the neighborhood plan is to have that, to take that to the next level, to take it to a planning level and concept study. Since we recognize that uh, the Orchard Corridor is not a simple, a, a simple bicycle pedestrian project. It certainly needs to be involved with the public, get their feedback, and then look at where and work with the community to see what alternatives are best for them. Uh, so certainly, we are recommending uh, to move it to that next level uh, through this uh, that we're in the project list. So that's actually one of the three planning projects that we have there recommended. So Ensign, by, by saying it's a planning project, does that mean that we would only be planning on pedestrian ADA improvements or would we be open to other aspects of the corridor? It will be open to all aspects of that. That's where the concept, concept study comes into play. It won't only focus on bike or pedestrian. It will open to any transportation needs in the area and what, whatever the community wants to bring up to us. Mr. Lucas. Uh, President May, members of the commission, uh, Commissioner Pickering, uh, Edinson did a great job uh, answering that question, and I'm not here to uh, undermine him in any way. I did want to just add a piece of information related to Orchard. It was a few years ago that the city of Boise contemplated creating an urban renewal district along that corridor, and that, uh, as you can imagine, would have a substantial impact on the resources and planning available to uh, make changes there. Uh, all of us have driven that corridor. We're all aware of the complexities of the parking and the access and the businesses that rely on that parking and access for their, um, for their, uh, you know, for their customers. So um, Orchard is a is a is a a huge opportunity. It's also um, something we need to go lockstep with the city of Boise on, even potentially URD, because I think that's where we're going to see uh, a comprehensive solution and not just a transportation solution. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate you saying that, Justin, because I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, and that's why I was hoping that you know us stating this and and moving forward wouldn't limit those conversations to you know just pedestrian ADA improvements. So I and I yeah I don't want to. I know this is a conversation for another day, but I just want to share that you know Orchard really deserves a lot of attention, and and we obviously can't do it without the city's support and um, and uh, energy. And so uh, yeah, that's something that I personally would really like to pursue and hammer out. So, um, but then another question, and since so I noticed that there were several low priority projects that were recommended. Could you just share? Like, what was the thought process in having several low priority projects in here rather than just medium or high? Commissioner May, uh, Commissioner Pickering, thank you. Uh, great question. Uh, in that regards, so we use ACHD prioritization as we start evaluating the uh, every single project in the plan in the that we are recommending. That way, we are uh, we take into account uh, our current prioritization elements and which Tom will discuss here in a few minutes but certainly uh, we wanted to um, see how that weights within uh, our current prioritization and how th those move forward in the future we also take into account that the community brings us into in 
com comments regarding that. So that means that it's a high priority for them. So certainly we weight that into it uh, to make sure that uh, even if it comes in low, but at, was attracted, what receive a lot of attraction for the community, that will bump, uh, bump it to the next medium or high, depending on the, the level of, uh, in, of, of interest from the public at that point. So wait, 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 I think I'm, let me just repeat what I think I heard. So if a lot of people have it as a low priority, it's more likely to come on to our recommended project list. Is that what you said or? Oh, sorry for the confusion. No, I, what I meant is that when we do the prioritization, prioritization for the project list, after we apply the, uh, the our prioritization, ACC prioritization into the project, uh, if the then then we apply a weight into the, each of the projects based on the public interest. So let's say gotcha. we receive more attraction to a specific location that receive additional points to make sure that those locations of high interest are moving forward faster than other ones. At least at the neighborhood level, then they will move into the integrated fire work plan process where they take a different a different process certainly. But yeah. Thank you for that, because obviously it's helpful to know what was the thought process around what's recommended or not, because um, as you can see, there's a ton of uh, opportunities for us to improve all across that entire neighborhood. So thanks for that, Ensign. And then one last question. Um, also, at Nez Perce Street, uh, it's lumped in as, uh, is it, what? Do you remind? Is it? And do you remember what it's lumped in as? Because I, I would prefer to see it as a traffic calming a uh, traffic calming project because there is so much speeding on this purse. And again, I'm worried that if we're super focused on it just being a bikeway or ADA project, it'll miss those nuances similar to like the Rose Hill uh, project. Um, uh, Madam President and Commissioner Pickering, yes. Uh, Rose Hill, we have an enter have a traffic calm in Nespers. Uh, yes, you, you're right. We have it as a uh, bicycle and ADA and pedestrian ADA improvement. So certainly we can accommodate that modification, certainly. Thank you, Edison. Thanks, Madam President. You bet. Any Ma other questions yes. or comments? Commissioner Goldthorpe. I'm going to go back and probe the depths of Justin's memory <laughs> since he brought it up, but I was going to anyway. Um, going back that few years that you talked about where there was some discussion with the city of Boise about about Orchard and uh, I'm remembering that we had several members of the city council um, Deanna Smith and a few others that came and talked to us about basically the blight that exists there and the opportunity that exists there to do some placemaking if I'm remembering the terms correctly and we thought that was a good idea I mean, I think there were five heads nodding up and down at that time. And then I, I've i lost track of where that went. Uh, Madam President, uh, Commissioner Goldthorpe. So um, our understanding right now, uh, as it relates to the Orchard Corridor, is that the city, um, and I, it's hard for me to speak on behalf of the city. I'm just giving you my impression, just to be clear. I, I don't, I don't know into the into the into the mind of of, of the city, but it, it appears that the city has prioritized the State Street corridor and the Vista corridor um, at this point in their process when it comes to uh, the urban renewal areas and the other things that they have been focusing on. As you can remember, they um, had a whole. Uh, the Live District uh, initiative that they started, and that was related to the Vista Corridor and the areas around the Vista Corridor. Um, and then obviously they did, when they were studying the URDs, they were looking at two. They were looking at State Street and they were looking at Orchard. And um, uh, apparently, for whatever reason, and I don't know, they decided to move forward with State Street and then just pause on Orchard. So um, the status right now on Orchard is, um, you know, we're, we're awaiting, you know, more, more action from the city there. And then they're also undergoing a comprehensive zoning code update, which may have an impact on a corridor like Orchard, where the new zoning um, regulations may allow for more and, and diverse types of uses. Um, that's, I guess that remains to be seen. So I don't know if that exactly answers your question, Commissioner Goldthorpe. There has been a lot because of activity. It pretty but, much does, yeah. because there seem to be, again, my memory, uh, there seemed to be quite a sense of urgency at the time, <laughs> and went, went, and that was a few years ago. Um, 
and when you look at it, it's still the same. And we have uh, a constant stream of, of TELUSes about some of the uh, road improvements, moving pipelines, and all that stuff in that area where the uh, tank farm is, and which is in closer proximity to Orchard. So I, I just wanted to bring it up because if uh, anybody on the Zoom from Boise is, uh, is there, maybe they might want to uh, bring us up to date a little bit about their particular intentions on it as well. I know that Vista and State Street are at the top of their list. Yes, sir. I'm still on the radar. It's a lot of different variables and nuances that we're waiting uh, to see how commissioners, they all play out. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. As you can see, it's once again, it's mentioned in the neighborhood plan. We have done a lot of work on parallel corridors in this area to Orchard, trying to make sure that there is good access um, in and around that area. Orchard itself, um, just due to the nature, it presents some, some, some challenges and obviously some opportunities. So, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, Edison, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you on the 28th. Thank you, Lynn. All right, project prioritization update and next steps presentation by Mr. Tom Laws. Welcome. Hello, Madam President, members of the commission. All right, so. There we go. So for the record, my name is Tom Laws, Planning and Programming Manager here with the Ada County Highway District. And I'm, I'm really excited to bring to you today um, the next update with the ACHD project prioritization um, process. So over the next few slides, I'll just give a quick refresher of that timeline and our initial findings review. Um, I'll talk about the implementation that has been occurring over the last few months since we um, last brought this to you back in June, and then go into a little detail about the next steps. Super. <clears throat> Just as a reminder, when we talk about prioritization and how that fits into the integrated five-year work plan, prioritization is really the method by which projects can be ranked or defined based on a, a set of criteria. Um, it's really only one component of that programming uh, effort, um, one tool in the toolbox, where um, once that prioritization ranking is in place, it then goes into that programming component, which looks at a variety of things such as schedule, timing, um, and, and really funding availability for where these programs can be placed in the integrated five-year work plan. And so, um, you know, at that point, um, we're able to incorporate those and, and program them into the budget, into the integrated five-year work plan. Looking over the timeline, uh, this effort was originally a, a commission directive back at the, the budget adoption hearing for the FY22-23 budget um, last August. And, and since that time, we've had several coordination meetings. Um, in green here, you'll see the commission work sessions that we've held. In red are our internal stakeholder meetings. Um, and then blue, uh, meeting with our, our, our partner stakeholders, uh, roughly a 15-person um, core team there. And really the, the goal of this effort was to um, break down into three different tasks. The first being an existing methodology and process review of, of our current methodology. Um, the second task being the nas national best practice review and comparing our methodology to our peers across the nation. And then task three is that enhancement and implementation of the findings. So as a reminder, back in June, uh, we had our consultant, Farron Pierce, come from Salt Lake to present some of those findings. Um, over uh, really the spring of this year, uh, they examined about 12 different agencies from state DOTs to metropolitan planning organizations to, to cities um, about the same size and structure of the highway district and, and compared our methodology with theirs. And, and really what they found is across the board, ACHD is indeed a leader with national best practice. That's terrific. Uh, yeah, That's, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, on, a, on a side note, uh, last week I attended the National Association of City Transportation Officials Conference, or NACTO, and during there I was, uh, I, I participated in a half-day workshop on prioritization, and, and similar to the findings of Fair and Peers, um, really everything that, um, that I learned and was seen from our peers from New York to Philadelphia to Toronto and even Mexico City, um, we are leading in the prioritization effort. So really exciting to, to have that reaffirmation. That yeah. Thank you very much for bringing us up to date on that and sharing Absolutely. that with us. Yep. 
Um, so other findings with the fair and peer analysis included um, looking at a potential for a cross-modal prioritization. And, and in the end, um, they were firm that that was not something that, to recommend. Um, looking across the nation, there was really only one agency that was actively doing this, that was the Virginia DOT. And even Virginia DOT staff said not to look this way. It was very, very complex. It took um, very, very time intensive. And at the end, it was, it was really a black box that their partners, the public, just didn't understand how projects were coming out of that. Madam President. Uh, Commissioner McKinney. Tom, so I don't mean to interrupt. Let's, let's uh, clarify when we talk about cross-modal prioritization, what are we talking about? So um, that was part of that commission direction, and it was to look at taking all of our projects, whether it's a roadway intersection, a sidewalk gap, an ADA improvement, a bike lane, and ranking all those projects equally. Um, currently, how our methodology works is we have roads and intersections that are prioritized with one methodology. We have crossings in one, we have bikes in one, and then we have pedestrian projects in another. Okay. Um, and so finally, the, the third, recommendation was really minor enhancements. So as I mentioned, um, we're really doing this right today. And so were there some small changes that we could make just to really fine tune it and make it even better? And, and really the next few slides, I'll go into detail with that, but it included streamlining our methodologies, uh, simplifying it for the public and increasing transparency. So just to highlight how we streamlined it, um, as I just mentioned with community programs, we originally had three different methodologies, one for bike facilities, one for pedestrian and one for crossings. And what we've done over the last few months is merged those all into one. And, and really an example of how we did that or what we've included with this new methodology is adding the level of traffic stress component for bicycle and pedestrians. Um, throughout the last three months, uh, we've tested this with our existing methodology and Farron Pierce also tested this and it, it passed that eyeball test, it passed that gut check that yes, this methodology is working as we intended. Um, it also um, was previously and, and still is on a 100 point scale, which was something that we heard was really important from peer cities that you get into a way that's really digestible for both partners and the public. With roads and intersections, we also took this and, and tried to simplify it in a few ways. And really the biggest with this component was uh, historically, our methodology wasn't on a 100-point scale, and so we, we took that and we tried to average it out to reach that 100-point scale, but then we also simplified a few things. So, for example, our annual congestion benefit cost-benefit ratio and our annual safety cost-benefit ratio were merged um, with our original methodology. We pulled those out, so if we really want to get into that level of detail of looking at what's the safety benefit of one project versus the other, the congestion benefit of one versus the other, um, we're now able to do that. Diving into how we simplify this for, for public use, really what we focused on are um, highly visual infographics um, and really simplifying the process as much as possible. So here are just two examples of those graphics that we've created. There's about a dozen so far um, that, that Farron Pierce has helped us with. And it's everything from really, it's, it's really at the end of the day telling our story and telling what ACHD is doing with the prioritization process, with the programming process, and the integrated five-year work plan. So here's a simple one on the left of simply what does the integrated five-year work plan do? And then on the right, it details how projects are selected, starting with our city and county comprehensive plans, moving through compass and community mo communities in motion, down to our strategic plan, our neighborhood plans and concept studies like you just heard from Christy and Edinson and eventually tying into that integrated five-year work plan. Um, the third thing was increasing transparency. We currently have an existing website. Um, you're probably most familiar with it with our integrated five-year work plan annual report where it's, it's mm -hmm. an interactive map that you can scroll down, click on individual projects. But one thing that our other peers had and that Farron Peers was recommending was really try to beef that beef up that uh, website presence, add more of these infographics. And so this is just a template of what that website would look like. We're working closely and plan to work closely with our communications team for when the branding comes out to really tie this together and make sure that it's on par with timing. everything. How exactly. Yeah. Um, but so um, what our intent is at least is to have several different pages. So at the top here, you can see we have the overview page of prioritization and the work plan. Um, what are the different programs we have? How are projects eligible? What's the due dates and timelines and how to, how to apply and more? Um, and so there are several pages like this that'll have, um, this is the process flow throughout the year. 
Um, here's another example of how projects are selected going from existing plans like our neighborhood plans, going from public requests or applications, um, do that, going through that prioritization programming and eventually into the work plan. Um, and then also really just telling that calendar story. So when does the official integrated five-year work plan begin for the next iteration? And you know, where are those opportunities throughout the year for the public to get involved, for our partners to get involved and, and so forth? So um, I know this is a lot of information, I'm going pretty fast, but um, I, I wanna really highlight that you know, this is an iterative process that we're constantly, um, you know, we, we view this prioritization effort and the integrated five-year work plan as a living document. We, we came to you, you know, several times last year and actually are planning to come back next, next month, but looking through um, really what our next steps are with the prioritization effort, it includes implementing some of um, those slight enhancements, adjustments with the prioritization methodology into our program software over the next few months. Um, it's beginning our next iteration of the integrated five-year work plan, and, and Christy will be back next month to, to really kick that off with you. Um, it's, it's holding our partner agency kickoff meetings and, and informing them and, and really tying in, or I guess tying up that stakeholder committee that we've had and really looking forward to their integrated five-year work plan next steps. Um, it's working with communications and the new branding on our website creation December through April of next year. And then once we've received all those projects um, through you, through um, our partners, through the public, it's starting that prioritization effort with the integrated five-year work plan um, next April and May. Um, so just to summarize, uh, you know, some of the main findings that came out of this effort was we really are a leader in terms of prioritization across the nation and Canada and, and Mexico. Um, our, the cross-modal prioritization is really something not recommended. There's only one DOT in the whole nation that's currently doing that. But there are minor tweaks and improvements that we can do to make our prioritization even better. That's simplifying, it's creating that website presence, um, and it's streamlining the methodologies even more. Um, so with that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Good job, Tom. I'm, I'm really impressed with the findings. So our recipe for success, simplification for the public, streamlining our methodologies, and in turn, that will increase that public, that process and the transparency for the public. Absolutely. Sounds like we're set up to, yeah, to make some things happen. Thank you very much. Madam Great President. Report. Goldthorpe. Yes, um, thank you for there towards the end of your presentation, mentioning the input of the commission and, and keeping us in the loop. And uh, um, this is going back to project prioritization and what we put you guys through in 2021, <laughs> which uh, I know was difficult um, because of the, and it was partially because of the uh, additional $5 million that we had budgeted for one particular purpose. And then again, it's happening this year. So I imagine this will all continue. But there was a number of projects that uh, were scoped for our benefit. And there were a couple of projects that were actually planned for construction this summer, small ones. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to maybe check, uh, uh, do some homework for me because the uh, crosswalk at uh, um, Spring Golden Valley, which was for this summer has not yet been done. And I know it's uh, a part of what we have done an incredible job with on those sidewalk gaps and other small projects that have made it so those two schools, uh, because of the improvements we've made between the middle and elementary school, there are much shorter lines of cars delivering kids to school in the morning, which has uh, alleviated quite a bit of the congestion and there's a lot larger bike racks because of what those um, projects have resulted in. So I just wanted to, to bring up before the cold weather hit that that was still hanging out there. Thank you. President May, uh, Commissioner Goldthorpe, absolutely, and our intent is at that October kickoff meeting to come back and provide some updates to several of those um, accelerated scoping efforts. So okay, now this was this was scoped and, and designed. So it's ready to shovel ready to, from what I was, what I understand. And here comes the guru. Focus. Uh, Commissioners, uh, good afternoon. Um, Madam President, Commissioner Goldthorpe, I am familiar with this request uh, at Spring Golden Valley. Um, we, we did, um, and this is just off my recollection, uh, we did look at this project. I, 
and I'm not trying to contradict you, but I do not believe it is scheduled for constru construction this summer. What we, what we uh, provided, I believe, to the commission several months ago as an update on that project, and it may not have been verbally, it may have just been a, a spreadsheet or in writing. I'll I don't back remember and look. hearing anything. And, and, I, I, and I totally understand that. So we provide, we provide a lot of things. And I, um, but I believe what we said was we were gonna roll that project into the larger valley project, which is um, this, that corridor. Okay, there's a sidewalk gap all yes. the way through up to Amity. So it, I, I just, I don't, I don't want you to have a, um, an unmet expectation that there is gonna be something happening on that specific crosswalk. Um, but let me loop, loop, let's loop back with you and get you that information and, the, and those details on that specific project. Okay, because um, I've just been asked by some of the neighbors. I, and I totally understand that. And so let me just make sure I, I, I'm, I'm going off the top of my head, but I, I, I do not want you to, I don't want to have an unmet expectation. So let's make sure we get you the, the, cor the correct information. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Jeff. Any other questions or comments? All right. Yes, yes. Uh, Commissioner Pickering needed to drop off, but she wanted to make sure that, for the record, that she loves the new methodology approach with the 100-point scale and really appreciates the simplicity. Okay, any other? Uh, let me just say thank okay. you, Tom, and look forward to uh, moving forward with the uh, additional uh, planning that we're scheduled to do. Yeah, yeah, great report. Appreciate the updates. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. All right, that was the last work session on our agenda. So we can just put that down and that's a wrap. <laughs>